Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining us on this lovely Monday afternoon. My name is Taya Wynn and I'm the executive director of the Community Design Collaborative. And we are excited to present to you today the third in our series of equity talks, the Latino perspective. Um, we've decided to take this year to look at the way architecture, community design, and community engagement intersect with issues of race, identity, and ethnicity with a lens examining how we're working on the ground in Philadelphia. We've used these talks as an opportunity to bring in uh, local experts, some of them, many of them are friends, clients, peers, colleagues, and former volunteers of the collaborative, former and current volunteers of the collaborative, to have this conversation within our community um, to better inform how we might be able to change the way we practice and change the way that we engage on the ground in some of our ethnic communities locally. Uh, we are happy today to introduce your moderator and your panelists that are all coming from various aspects of working in the Philadelphia region with um, aspects of the Latinx culture. Uh, and they are all also members um, of the Latinx ethnicity. So we thank them today for their authenticity and for their willingness to share with us a little bit about their perspective about how design community engagement have engaged that community. I would like to welcome you all um, and introduce Harry Tapia. Harry is uh, an employee at Hase, as well as one of our esteemed board members at the Collaborative, and he will be coordinating and leading this conversation today. So Harry, take it away. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Taya. Uh, as Ty mentioned, I've had the pleasure of being on the Design Collaborative board for the past two years. Um, I've been employed at Hase, where uh, I'm concentrating in uh, community development. We mostly focus on low-income senior housing uh, with a very big emphasis on home ownership. And we have a very robust uh, home uh, housing counseling department. Uh, I am grateful to have this opportunity and be able to talk and have this conversation along with uh, some of the uh, partners that, you know, that we have on here uh, and some of the panelists. Um, so uh, I wanna you know, let the panelists start introducing themselves so that we can uh, begin our discussion. Um, so uh, first, uh, Jennifer, if you can please introduce yourself. Uh, so good afternoon and Harry, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to join this conversation and thank you for uh, to Tia as well. It's been a while I've been in this group of folks with this group of folks. So um, I am Jennifer Rodriguez. I am president and CEO of the Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Um, we are an organization dedicated to supporting Latino entrepreneurs scale up. And as a little bit of context, I'll let you know that Latinos are the most entrepreneurial demographic in the country. Um, however, when Latinos start businesses, those businesses start smaller and remain smaller as we, um, even as they mature. And in Philadelphia, only 4% of Latino owned businesses have employees. And so I think the conversation will be a very rich one today. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, Amanda, would you go next? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amanda Garayua. 
I am a second generation Latina. My, both my parents have migrated to Philadelphia from Puerto Rico in their um, elementary age years. I am the housing services manager here at ASE. I've been with ASE for 12 years. I started working at ASE as a part-time administrative assistant for the housing counseling department while working on my social behavior degree. And working at ASE opened my eyes to this new world of development, of affordable housing, of financial coaching, and I became very interested. Um, I was then given the opportunity to become a housing counselor. So housing counselor for eight years. And now I'm a housing services manager overseeing two offices and 10 staff. Uh, the reason why I do, why I love what I do is to connect our community, our individuals that we serve to all resources to overcome poverty, generational poverty, and to achieve financial wellness. Thank you for having me. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Damaris, if you can please go next. Thank you, Harry. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Damaris Feliciano. I am the Director of Community Relations and Strategic Initiative for the Managing, Depart Managing Directors Department with the, Phil the City of Philadelphia. I have been working in the community and I started in the um, nonprofit arena and now I am in the city for almost uh, a little bit past 20 years. I love working with the nonprofits. I started uh, way back with uh, Congresso and moved from there. I always loved working in the community. I think that the Latino community are very passionate. Um, they love giving back and they always are very accepting of everyone. Um, and that's why I'm here today. I, I, liked, I love the topic. I wanna to speak about our community and how we can really robust and take resources to our community. Uh, thank you for having me, Harry. Perfect, thank you. Eric? Hi, thanks, Harry. And I'm honored to, hear, to be here with uh, the rest of the panelists. My name is Eric Martinez um, from Santander Bank, work with Santander Bank. Uh, been there for 10 years and uh, I'm a first generation actually in the US. Uh, my parents my, immigrated to the to Maryland DMV area about uh, in the 90s. Um, so I have two siblings and, and myself and I moved to Philadelphia 10 years ago. Um, and I've been living in the old Kensington area uh, for the past five. So uh, I love the, the community, the, the Hispanic feel that it has and a, a proud board member of Hase and um, just really, really, really um, honored to be here again and encouraged by you know the progress that has been made in Philadelphia in the short 10 years that I've been here. So uh, I'm excited for the conversation and uh, thanks again, Harry, for inviting me. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, you know, to the entire panelists uh, for uh, being with us today. Uh, so we're going to dive into the first question. Um, the first question is going to be geared towards Damaris. So Damaris, as a longtime Latina leader uh, who worked and lived in um, our communities, can you speak a little bit uh, on the history of inequality uh, that our community have faced uh, over uh, the past 34 years? Of course, Harry. So as everyone knows, Latinos have faced equality um, since the 1950s in Philadelphia. Uh, they began when they began migrating to the city from different um, the other regions as Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Cuba, and other places. Latinos have been impacted by systematic poverty. Years of the government's disinvestments have created barriers to access to resources for the Latino community. In addition, Latinos have experienced many social barriers such as discrimination, uh, lack of high-skilled employment opportunity, with most back then working in factories. As you know, the American dream was all factories, and most Latinos were at some time in their lives worked in a factory. Due to limited, and this was due to limited English and education. And um, and uh, they did have some Latinos who worked and owned their own businesses, but that was very few. And these individuals uh, owned their businesses. And what we all know is Bloque de Oros, or they have bodegas in different part of, parts of the Latino communities. And in fact, if you all know and are very familiar with Concilio, which I was part of for six years, the council speaking organization, that, that agency was, this organization was established in 1962 to address 
the inequality and discrimination that at that time Latinos were facing. It was a group of merchants who got together and will meet at a basement in a house on Front Street and um, to address these issues and be the voice. They were la voz for the Latino community, right? Um, this organization that started at a, I wanna say a kitchen table, but actually was a basement table, really um, evolved. And next year they'll be celebrating 60, 60 years of existence. Um, they really evolved to become the organization and the first and longest Latino organization. From Concilio, we also have other organization as Congreso, um, the Aspirans, and other entities that are here to assist uh, the Spanish-speaking population. As we move forward in years, factories began relocating and closing. Uh, this was this made an impact because now our Latino community have fewer opportunities to build build wealth. Uh, with limited resources, many Latinos did not have financial literacy to build asset wealth. They ran it for years and did not purchase their own homes. They survived as they could and made do. Their priority was to provide food at the table and really provide a shelter over their head. They didn't think of what's going to happen in the future, meaning purchasing homes for the equity and really building their assets, right? Um, to, due to the lack of building asset, most Latinos, especially our third generation now, are currently being impacted by gentrification, displacement, lack of opportunities in the, in the design and community development. Um, as gentrification continues to rise in the Latino community, Latinos are being pushed out. Rents are increasing to affordable prices and taxes are also increasing. Although there's many resources, as we all know, for homeowners, because they have equities in their property, there's limited resources for renters. This is leaving our third generation in despair and really trying, struggling to live a healthy life. Um, politics has always played a big divide in our community. Uh, to make a difference, we, we all must work together and be one voice. We must work together to really educate and provide opportunities to our fellow Latino community, and especially our youth. Uh, we must be really be able to educate our youth on financial literacy, take it to their schools, meet them where they at, take it to local organizations where our, our community can get to, it'll make it easier for them. We break that barrier. Um, if they can't make it to downtown to get some, some resources, let's bring it to our local organizations and especially the schools. I think the younger our youth learn about uh, financial literacy, the better off we'll be for our future. Um, and, and, they, and they need to know the importance of credit building, a home ownership and budgeting. Latinos have come a long way since the 1950s, but we still have ways to go. Let's not forget Philadelphia is one of the biggest cities, but one of the poorest cities in the country. So, um, and we also have the fastest growing Latinos. So if we take, uh, we can change history and we can educate our youth now. In years to come, our youth will know about asset building. Um, they'll know about credit building and budgeting. And we can just may be the voice. Perfect. Thank you, Damaris. Um, you know, thank you for all that background. Um, of course, you know, as, as a, you know, a minority community, we definitely have struggle, right, with inequalities. Mm -hmm. uh, the things that, that you touched on that um, really to, you know, to, to us as a group, I think it it's really has a direct line um, to sort of the low representation that our Latino community has. Mm -hmm. in, design and community development. And, and, and to me, you know, to us really, it's, it's asset building, right? So you don't know what you don't know, right? And because traditionally we haven't had the opportunity to build wealth and to work in the trades, mm -hmm. it shows a, a direct line, you know, on, on why we're so underrepresented uh, in this industry that, you know, it, it, it's really, to, you know, uh, to help us, right? Community redevelopment, you know, how do we get more Latinos uh, into this industry to make sure that they're building wealth, right? So to me, there is a direct line between those, those two things. Um, so my next question is going to be for Jennifer. Um, so Jennifer, Latino historically, we've had uh, very low numbers, right? 
uh, in the trade unions, right? Can you please explain the impact that those inequalities have in the Latino community? Sure. Um, so one of the first things I'll say is that entrepreneurship in uh, the construction industry is the fastest growing segment for the Latino community. So Latinos are starting business in the construction and related industries at very, very high rates. Um, however, that's not necessarily the case in Philadelphia. And a lot of what, what we fail to appreciate, I think at the city level, is the role that union participation and the link between union participation and entrepreneurship in the construction industry has. Um, as we all know, uh, the construction industry is one in which the apprenticeship and journeyman is really the preferred or is the, the standard method for, for getting into the field. Um, you can go to high school and you can specialize in carpentry or in welding, but um, really the most effective, efficient, and most successful avenue for individuals to get into this line of business is through the trade unions. And by having very low participation, we end up consequently having very few Latino owned businesses starting and scaling in the, in the, in the trades. So we have very few general contractors. We have very few uh, scaled Latino owned businesses in this sector. Um, what happens is that you, you enter the trades, you learn the best practices, you develop your network, you get to know the large um, companies that are doing business in the industry. And we know that really scaling business and doing business is a lot about building your network, about building building who are the experts, who knows where things are buried, right? Who, you know, if you are not in that, if you're not in that network, if you're not part of the decision making process, then it's gonna be much harder for you to really be competitive. Um, and so what we're finding is that businesses in the construction industry in the Latino community um, tend to, a lot of them tend to be um, immigrant laborers that come to Philadelphia and they want to start a business. And so they've learned a skill at home and now they want to scale up, but they don't have the practices. They have never worked in a union. They don't quite know how to, how to really operate the business part of the trade. Um, and so we really um, are playing catch up in our community um, uh, to scale and to get these businesses, you know, at a, in, a, in a scale that really um, is, um, you know, that, that can really make an impact and transform and create wealth. And also what we know is that we are going to enter a pretty significant period of construction in this industry, whether it is because of affordable housing crisis that is really uh, prompting uh, institutions um, and governments to increase construction in that industry, which then uh, triggers contracts and opportunities for businesses, um, or whether it is a federal infrastructure bill that is expected to come in one way or another, whether the full uh, proposed plan um, that President Biden has or any scaled down version will still be very significant. And from our understanding and conversations with the streets department that stands to be the beneficiary, the, the primary beneficiary of the funding through this infrastructure bill, um, we will be in building mode for at least the next 10 years. It will take the city that long to absorb the infrastructure dollars. So really we have clearly an opportunity here to build and to build the skill and to build these companies. Um, but again, you know, we, I think union participation is a, is a great avenue to, to do that. Um, as a remedial um, option, what the Hispanic Chamber is doing and actually starting this week is a program that we call Build Latino. It's a Spanish language capacity building program for enterprises and businesses in the construction industry, especially geared towards very small firms um, that need capacity building in that area. So, I think one of the other things that, um, you know, you, you touched on that, um, you know, there's very many paths, right, to design 
in, in the construction and community development. And I think we lost you, Harry. I think, Harry, we may have lost you. Um, okay, so I think um, okay, now. Oh, now we have you, yes. <laughs> okay, all right, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, there, there's a, a, another distinct line, um, right, between there's very many paths to, um, you know, becoming in our industry, right, working within, um, you know, the community development and design, and those roads that aren't necessarily, you know, cyclical, where you go from high school, college, straight into our trade, um, because we don't know what we don't. So um, as a community, we really don't know all the opportunities that are in community development and, um, you know, the design world. So uh, I'm going to call on you again, Damaris, can you speak a little bit about your personal experience with you know, uh, education and then leading right into, you know, uh, our, our industry. Hmm. Uh, with my education or education as yes. in general? Yeah, yeah, both. Mm. Um, so I, we're living in a, a time where um, college is not for everyone, right? Um, education is important, but college is not for everyone and I'm a true believer of that. Um, I believe everyone should try, uh, should go and they should really process and see what's best for them. For some individuals, trade schools, as um, Jennifer stated, is the best way to go. Um, there's some individuals that will that feel more comfortable in going to trade school um, versus college, and there's some individuals that do the same with college. And then in the third fold, there's some individuals that are more hands-on that um, can be entrepreneurs on their own and have the ability to do this on their own. Um, I, I truly believe one should really, really go for what they feel is best for them. Me personally, um, I decided to go back to school as an adult learner. Um, I decided to, I did the trade school and then I went on to go to college once the trade school got my foot in the door to start up my career. Then I, I did decide to go to college and um, got my undergrad in business administration and then decided to get go full force and get my master's um, again in business administration. I, tr I truly understand that this is not the path for all and um, everyone should really, should, should really know what there was best for them and not be, um, not be forced to do go to college or go to a trade school because that's what they're supposed to do. Um, it, it feels that your success is more when you follow your own paths and you follow what you want to do. I think, I believe individuals are more successful. And then there's individuals who are not um, test. They don't, they don't like to test. They don't like to, um, they're, they're learners, but they don't like doing the tests. And sometimes I think those are barriers as well. These tests that are being posed on us um, to get into trade schools, to get into the carpentry, to get into the union, you must have a, uh, you must hit a threshold in the testing, and that's not for everyone. Um, and I believe that's one of the barriers that is really getting individuals into the trade schools, into the country, into the union. Um, and maybe we should reassess that so more Latinos can get into the carpentries and the contracting and in and, and the unions, the trades. Perfect. Thank you, Damaris. Um, is my picture better or am I still very choppy? You're still frozen. Not uh, still choppy. It's all right. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. We're working to get Harry back in one second. Thank you. Can I ask you a question from the from the community while we wait on Harry? Mm -hmm. um, the question is, can you recommend any professional organizations for Latinos to connect with other Latinos in the fields, such as the design community and development 
groups of networks to connect with? Any recommendations? Um, well, um, I do know that there are some arc the in the architecture world there are uh, some ethnic minority associations or groups within the architecture world. I think Mario Zacarias is in the audience, so he can probably talk to that much better. Um, we have had conversations with ULI um, in their desire to diversify um, their membership. So that's an organization that is very well attended and well known in the real estate architecture and similar um, industries. Um, we at the Hispanic Chamber do, do have a young professional network and that really interacts very closely with our membership and we have a number of very um, excellent and well regarded um, professionals in the design and design industry, construction industry, um, architecture, engineering, and such. So that's a place where you can also, if you're, you know, interesting, come in in really interacting with the Latino professional and uh, entrepreneurship community, where you can you can join us or you can attend our events. Thank you so much. Hey, Harry. Uh, hey, uh, I'm back. I'm having connection issues, of course. Uh, so I, I apologize to the to uh, to the panelists, and everybody that's on watching us. Um, so circling back, I, I uh, one of the things that I did want to touch on, right, is um, as a Latino community, again, entrepreneurship uh, and wealth building are both a dotted line. Why um, we've been really low represented in the community in design um, development. One of those reasons, right, is uh, access to, to finance, right? Access to capital uh, and discrimination that happened, not for our generation, where it's, it's getting better for our generation, but for the past generations. Um, so Eric, um, you know, as a Latino, uh, is working for a major bank and is lending in the Latino community. Wanted to get your perspective and your experience um, you know, working within banking and lending to the Latino community. Thanks, Harry. I'll take the blame. It's, it's the bank's <laughs> fault. <laughs> and uh, no, joking aside, um, like you said, I think it, it. there's been a lot of progress and a lot of focus in the past uh, 10 years to two decades, really, um, around um, helping those disenfranchised um, access to capital, um, making it <clears throat> cheaper for uh, those that um, are, are entrepreneurs um, that might not have that perfect credit score, that might not have that car to travel to their work. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, I think in, uh, in banking, that's, um, that's been, a, been a long uh, issue, like you've said, uh, and, and regulation has tried to help Sometimes it's helped, sometimes it's really just made it worse. Um, but uh, recently, uh, the ESG, which is environmental, social, and governance um, laws that were enacted two years ago has made a huge um, enact, uh, push forward towards institutions to be measured by the shareholders and say, look, we want companies uh, that invest in the community. We want companies that care about social issues. We want company, our shareholders want to see those measurements and how you guys are tracking. Um, and that's really been a voice of the minorities and the Latinos as uh, shareholders saying like, we don't, we want to see change and we need to measure you. Um, and ESG has been a big um, initiative towards that. Um, so, <clears throat> That, that leads to you know, community investment uh, from leaders, um, not just people who are working like myself um, in the community, that comes from the CEO, that comes from all executive levels um, in Silicon Valley, New York, in Miami, where investments are, are coming in. Um, they're saying, you know, we need to invest in the communities where we serve, um, which is piling on more money because our shareholders are asking for it. At the end of the day, that's really what drives private companies. Um, so you know the what you what you see from um, large banks is uh, investment in the community um, via either educating um, with uh, through other organizations that they partner with 
you might not see the bank going out there and doing it on their own, but they obviously help other organizations um, do that, uh, take that effort on. Um, and then also through uh, showing customers that, uh, like recently last week, we had a panel with uh, the CEO, of We Are All Human, from We Are All Human, Claudia Romo Edelman. Um, which is really eye-opening, inspiring. She's really motivational, right? So we uh, sat something there. Twenty percent of employees identify as Latinos, um, which is pretty high representation, mostly because we're in Texas, in in Florida, in the Northeast, right? So there's obviously um, a lot of Latinos in those areas. Um, so we want to show our communities that you know we have, especially in Latino communities, that we have employees that can help them that we speak Spanish, that if you wanna work for Santander, we are the number one employee to go work for because we you know, we have leadership that supports you, that cares about you, um, and that wants to see Latinos progress. Um, and they understand the consumer impact of um, Latinos in the US. I, I mean, Jennifer probably knows these numbers from the back of her hand, but you know, the, the, there's one in five entrepreneurs in the US are Latinos. You know, we're the fastest GDP growing outside of China and India. Um, we have a tremendous amount of growth in the future. I think the mo we are the youngest um, generation or the youngest um, diverse group of, of people in the U.S. I think the mode number is 11 years. So that's 11 years is the most number that you'll see from Latinos, which means we have a tremendous amount of growth in the future. So if you want to align yourself to a winning team, you're going to say, I want to attract Latinos to my organization. I want to attract customers that have that Latino um, background because they're the future of the U.S. Um, so that, that's well known. I'm preaching to the choir here probably, but um, that's how banks today are kind of looking at communities that they serve at. Uh, and um, I think that was all I have for that question. Perfect. No, no, thank you. Uh, thank you for that answer. Um, yeah, and, and, and so I, I so want to expand on, on something that you mentioned, right? So very fortunate that Santander has a lot of Latinos that, that make up their, their company. Um, so, you know, for the entire panel, right, we, um, as Latinos, right, usually when we go into industry, we're, we're very few, right? Um, especially in, you know, design and community development. So um, ha how have your experience been as being one of the few, right? So, um, you know, one of the few Latinos that are, are in our industry. So that's to me, that question is to me? Uh, that's to the panel itself. Um, so yeah. again, it's a great, yeah. it's great that Santander has 20%. Latinos, right, right. that has to be amazing, no, right? No. Walking into, um, you know, uh, an employer that you have a lot of people that look like you, right? Um, but, you know, um, how has that been on, for the rest of the panel, right? Uh, how has your experience been where you walk in and you're probably the only Latina yeah. or Latino in, in your industry? If I may, I can I be happy. Oh, yes, please. Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> And so in my line of work, I'm in commercial banking. Um, I didn't explain this earlier, I wish I did, but basically middle market companies um, in the Philadelphia, really national level. So larger mature companies have been around for generations um, that uh, have an established banking relationship typically um, that understand the business, have a team, a uh, finance team that can help them grow and advise them. Um, usually, I'm the only one, the youngest one that looks like me in that group. Um, so for a long time, I dealt with like the imposter syndrome. Like, what am I doing here? How did I get here? Do I really belong here? Do they really want me here? Um, so I, that was something that always crept, crept up in my head. But, you know, just having the confidence in your ability, the confidence in what you've been doing for so long and the confidence that, you know, you're, you can advise these customers, you can bring add value um, and you have an organization that stands behind you when that happens. So um, definitely, um, you know, want to see more people like me, more Latinos. Um, I mean, it helps that I'm a male. I think 
the females are even more at a disadvantage as a Latina. It's even a bigger gap. Um, so uh, yeah, I definitely want to see more uh, of my people that speak the language, that have a culture background that I can, sometimes I have to pretend that I'm, you know, speaking a different type of way or acting a different type of way just so I don't like, you know, uh, stand out as much, I guess. Um, but, you know, I feel more comfortable if there was like two or three more Latinos in the room, obviously. Um, so, I mean, uh, yeah, that's that's been my experience in, in my work field. Um, when I see a Latino that's been doing well and has a mature business, I get really excited and um, we connect so well and it's always uh, a good experience or a good, uh, good conversation, but I want to see a lot more. <clears throat> Perfect. And, and so I, you know, I want to build on what Eric says. I know as, as males, you know, uh, it, it is a little easier when, when we're the only ones. Um, so for the Latina that are, are, are on this panel, can you talk about your experience as being one of, again, one of the few, one of the only ones, uh, you know, in, in, in your, your past, uh, you know, career, explain how, um, you know, uh, the effect that that has. I could go first. Um, so uh, a lot of my career so far has been dealing with the community. Um, dealing with the community, is it is an advantage to be not only a woman, but also a Latina that can speak to the community in their language and meet where they are at. Now, as I am getting inching more to the development side, I would say, I don't, I'm not sure if it's more of the Hispanic side or just being a woman, if it's a disadvantage. Um, we, as a Latina, we have to push a little harder to be heard. We have to push a little harder to be seen. Um, you know, contractors, I'm and now learning how to speak to contractors and contractors may not speak to me the way that they speak to Harry, or they may go to the man first before they reach out to the woman. And that is uh, what I'm learning to maneuver now. It is frustrating, um, but as a Latina, you have we have to learn how to get that respect and let them know that, hey, we are supposed to be here as well. We are able to have a chair at the table as well. Um, what is also good is um, Damaris and I have similar um, uh, background on this is that we had a great mentor of a Latina, um, Maria Gonzalez, which is the president of ASE. She has pushed me every step of the way being an administrative assistant at ASE to now where I am now. Um, so I think that is a great advantage of having someone, a Latina, look out for you. Um, that has played a major role in my career. So I, I think, um, Harry, one of the things that I would like to point out in this panel and, and to the audience out there is really, uh, I'm no longer sort of one of the few in the room. I worked in the, in the economic development, business development uh, for diverse communities or minority communities in many, in some instances. So I'm really, you know, in a, in a group that is pretty diverse, generally speaking, and very different from my early days when I was working in public private financing in the city, when I was the only Latina at PIDC and Philadelphia Industrial Development Corporation. And it cost some, you know, Judge Nelson Diaz had to come down to PIDC because they found the Latina, you know, that they had never had a Latina, you know, for decades, apparently, in, in the organization. Uh, so things have changed a lot. But one of the things I want to stress is how different Philadelphia is from other parts of the country. I happen to sit on the board of directors of the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, which brings me or takes me to different, um, to, to states and cities around the country. And it is, in my opinion, something that we really need to work on. And is that the Latino community in Philadelphia is amongst the poorest community in the nation, mm -hmm. right? So that, it is not, it is when I go to other cities and I see the participation of Latinos in the economy, the participation of Latinos in the professional sector across industries, it is a different picture. Uh, it is a much more vibrant, wealthier, um, and more engaged community and much more influence that we have here in the city of Philadelphia. And in fact, um, I think 
that one of the things we need to work on is really developing um, those connections between the local um, Hispanic community and the Hispanic community outside of the city of Philadelphia, outside of the region, because there's a lot of wealth, a lot of experience that can, we can bring to bear in our community. Um, so I think that, you know, I think we in Philadelphia happen to be in a really, I think, um, uh, in a in a very challenging position because you know we are the poorest demographic at a 40 percent poverty rate that has remained unchanged for the last 40 years right and that is not the norm in in this country yeah thank thank you jennifer um and again i i I'd like to point out the dotted line between wealth building right and representation in design and community development. Uh, I know one of the things that, um, right, we have very low uh, participation um, in, in this industry. And I think one of the ways that us as a Latino community um, have, you know, combated this is really creating our own opportunity, right? So um, as the Maris was mentioning, we have, we're very fortunate to have great nonprofit organizations that are within our community. I know other minorities don't, don't have that, that same opportunity. So, you know, you have great nonprofits like ASE, Congresso, Concilio, APM, that give, you know, folks from the community the opportunity to, to participate and not just to participate, to see what this industry, you know, it is. Um, so, you know, my next question is, is to Amanda. Um, so Amanda, of course, you know, uh, you, you work here at ASE um, and, you know, we're very fortunate, again, as a Latino community to have strong assets uh, in our neighborhood. Uh, how do you see your work increasing the equality for the community that we serve in order to increase participation uh, in this industry of design and uh, community redevelopment? Right. So like you said, Harry, we have very great organizations in the Latino community, particularly in North Philadelphia. Like you said, we have ASE, APM, Congreso, SEBA, Esperanza, and the others, um, just to name a few. And all these organizations, they specialize in something. Um, they do a lot of work, but they all specialize in something such as ASE with affordable housing and community development and housing counseling and Congreso with their workforce development and education and SABA with their tax prep and ITIN. We all have something uh, different to provide different resources. And one thing we see a lot, no matter what service they come in for is this generational poverty. So how do we be overcome that ger generation generational poverty. The, these are people that are struggling on a daily basis, on a daily crisis, on whether they're going, are they able to pay their rent? Are they able to keep their utilities on? How are they going to provide food for their family the next day? Um, so this has been passed, this poverty has been passed decade through decade, and how do we overcome that as organizations to the community? And it's connecting our community to resources available. Right, we have to inform them, help them to apply, let them know that these are services um, available. Because um, a lot of times services may be available and they don't know because of a language barrier or they don't know because they don't know how to apply because of lack of internet or whatever it may be. These organizations are there to help them overcome as much obstacles as they can. Um, and one thing that we have recognized is credit right? Credit is everything. You need credit to get a credit card, to get a loan, to get your student loans, to, to buy a house. That is the key to unlock many things, many options. If you have credit, credit is everything, right? We can all agree on that. So what our organizations in the Hispanic community are, are educating the community about credit. It's very rare for Hispanic families to talk about credit, to talk about financial education in the home. So we are hoping to, to, to change that, change the narrative in the community, let them learn that as young as they can, as the mayor said. Um, and if they have the credit, they are then able to get into home ownership and there's down payment assistance and you can build your wealth and your equity and we can help you uh, preserve that 
home ownership, your home. We also help with income supports uh, resources uh, like free tax preparation. So many families were able to overcome poverty because of the child tax credit resource that a lot of our organizations helped people to apply for. Um, and there's many of us that are financial opportunity centers, which focus on increasing income, increasing the financial coaching, and helping them with job training and job employment um, and overcoming these language barriers. So these organizations all together, we are building wealth in the community. We're helping overcome poverty. And um, we also are coming together for once. And you know, we have a Latino Equitable Development Committee and we are actually working together, getting everyone all these resources so that they can build wealth, that they can change the cycle, break the cycle of poverty in their family and build wealth for the generations to come. Perfect, thank you. Um, I think one of the things that, um, Brian, again, we have very low representation within this industry. And, um, and so I, I want to have a conversation, start the conversation on, on how do we spread that out, right? How do we spread the word and how do we, um, you know, uh, provide that education to younger Latinos so that they can uh, be a part uh, of this industry that we're really low represented. Um, so, you know, financial education is definitely one. Um, Damaris and Jennifer, is there anything that you guys are working on educational wise to really, you know, target the younger Latino community? I would like to point out um, that yes, there is low representation in this industry now, but slowly we'll get there. Almost all these organizations that Amanda spoke about and referred to, they're women led. Their EDs are Latina women, which is amazing. That wasn't the case 10, 15 years ago. Um, Jennifer is, um, she's leading the Hispanic chambers. We have ASE, which is led by Maria. And I, my hat to, I take off my hat to Maria. Um, I always say it's a man's world that she's ruling, right? Um, she's paving the way. We have Joanna Otero Cruz, who now is going to run, uh, go lead Women Against Abuse. We have Carolina, who's heading Congreso. Uh, we have APM, Nelsa Ruiz, um, Taller Puerto Riqueño, which was Carmen Febo. Now she's turning the baton to another Latina female, young Latina female. So I just, I just wanted to point that out that um, we're striving, the, we're striving, and we're getting there. And I will see in one day this industry will be dominated. Sorry, guys, <laughs> by women. <laughs> by women. And I think it's um, we can really. For me, the key is getting to our, our young youth early. It's getting into the schools. It's showing them that there's different careers paths, the different things that they can explore. Um, not, not that uh, we have anything against being a lawyer, which by the way, there's a decrease in Latina lawyers. So we should, that should be one, right? Um, and we need Latina nurses. We have a low, um, we have low uh, representation in Latina nurses and law and lawyers. So those are two careers that would definitely be awesome um, to have more representation Latinas, right? Um, so I, uh, me personally, I think the school is the best way to get in there young, um, have different, bring the resources to the community, meet them where they're at. Um, if we have different, we have definitely different resources in the cities that we try to take to the community through our community education academy. We, we like to link up um, our residents with the resources that are available that they don't know about, sort of, and there's UB, You'll be surprised how many people or how many individuals don't know that there's certain services like housing, rental assistance down the block. All you got to do is go down the block and go in into one of the organizations and it's available to you. And you do have Latinos who will help you in your language because that's another barrier. And if that's and if that's if Spanish speaking or not Spanish speaking is the barrier, we have language access. Um, we can provide, you can call a hotline and you can get your the information in that language that you best you prefer. Um, that's a resource that a lot of people do not know about that we have in Philadelphia, right? Um, so for me, I think the best is education is the key in trying to get the word out as much as possible. The 
biggest method of uh, the biggest method of marketing is word of mouth, right? So as Latinos, let's use that. Let's keep pushing it. Let's pay it forward. And that's the best method. Because if I tell one person, believe it, that Latino keep, keep telling the other person about the resource, especially if they get results, if there's an outcome, right? They'll tell them, mira, vete pa hacer, right there. They're giving you money. They're giving you money for rent. They don't tell them all the information, but they send them your way, right? Um, so I think that's the best way. And we're just going to keep on the word of mouth. And that's the best way in bringing meeting individuals where they at. So Harry, one of the things um, that, and I think in our prep call, we talked a little bit about this and it's one of the saddest days that I've had in my professional career um, when it comes to reaching out to young populations and, and, and students was career day. And this is really a call to action to the professionals in the audience um, that, you know, do not do not stay in your desk, in your office. Uh, you really need to get out in the community. Uh, you really need to expose um, our students and our young people to what does it mean to be a GIS professional? What is it to be a civil engineer? Um, a lot of the kids and youth in our community they approach career development through the eyes of their advisors or their family members. And the reality is that our kids, our youth, don't have enough architects, engineers, surveyors, GIS professionals in their friends, amongst their friends and families. And, you know, unfortunately, the school district and our, our school system is not really uh, achieving the desired results. Um, I find that there are too many of our youth are getting steered into social service um, uh, careers, which as, um, as honorable as they may be, the reality is that we are over indexing and over represented in those careers. And conversely, we are under represented in high growth careers and careers that require, imagine the creativity of becoming an architect, really how exciting it is to be a civil engineer uh, out on the street, measuring, getting your hands dirty. Um, there are many careers and even the trades, right? Where our, 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 our kids are just not being exposed. So that old story was that I was at, when I worked, I did work at Asociación Puerto Riqueños en Marcha, APM um, in the early 2000s. Um, and I was asked to go to one of the schools to career day. And career day, the professionals there were um, emergency, uh, um, an emergency ambulance driver, a police officer, a fire person, and an attorney, and me. I was a city planner. I mean, that is not really the true representation of the opportunities that should be available to our youth and to our children. So I think I really, I really, I think this is a call to action again to the collaborative and to the professionals in the audience to really become involved in, in career days, in, in other programs um, that, that really will bring more people in touch with these careers. I will make a mention um, to the former chairman of the board at GPHCC, Lou Rodriguez, the largest Latino civil engineering firm in the region. Uh, and he has started um, uh, Rodriguez University, which is really about building the skills of students and youth in the civil engineering industry with workforce development programs in surveying, right? So he is training surveyors. Surveyors earn a really good wage. Surveyors do not need to go to uh, get a bachelor's degree in order to acquire their skills. Um, so I think a lot of that work, um, the other person that is doing great work is Mike Diaz of Semper Utilities, the largest uh, utility installation um, company in in the in in Philadelphia, probably one of the largest Latino owned in the in the in the country, and he's also doing an apprenticeship to to bring uh, youth, particularly in the Latino community, to those really high, well well paying jobs. Yeah, Jennifer, I, that's great point. Um, you know, the private institutions, the public institutions. Um, I was going to add is. You know, we just passed Hispanic Heritage Month and we celebrated a month. We had, a, we've seen a lot of people uh, and companies uh, really dive into it and show their uh, employees that they care about them. And, you know, you see it on TV, you see it on marketing. I think uh, 
in the past five years, you've you probably noticed a little change on that. I've noticed in the NFL specifically, um, a little bit more showcasing of the Hispanic and Latinos and uh, when, you know, those primetime games and such. So just celebrating those moments um, across the U.S. for Latino achieving something that's really inspiring. Um, you know, maybe an astronaut went out to space and it was a Latino, like a Latina. We should be celebrating that. As an engineer that sent them off to space, like we should be seeing that on, in Times Square. Um, so, you know, if the city or companies have someone in their, um, uh, in their staff that really stands out, uh, why not celebrate it and tell everybody, look, this is the people we hire, these are the people we want to uh, celebrate in our community. So, um, you know, if you were a kid and you saw that walking in the streets and you heard about it, talking about it, you're like, oh, I want, I'm curious, I want to be an engineer. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's really moving when you see that and, you know, talks to your point, Jennifer, if you go out in the community, you showcase your, um, your talents and, uh, talk to the kids instead of them having to grow up with um, something that's not so desirable in the community um, makes a huge difference. I yeah, totally, I totally agree. I mean, I was almost the result of what Jennifer was saying. I my first degree is in social behavior and social workers. Yes, they're needed. It's great. But honestly, you won't make a great living unless you have a master's degree. So if I was not exposed to this world, I would have never known. So it's very, it's so important to, to be out there, to talk to the youth, have free internships, anything would, would be good. And just assure, ensure that anything is possible. We have our first, well, Philadelphia has the first city solicitor, Diana Cortez, a Latina, right? Um, we have to ensure and let them know, let our youth know everything is possible. Everything is possible if you put your mind to it. Um, you could be our next mayor. Our young Latino could be our next mayor, right? So everything is possible. Yeah, um, and I think that again it has a dotted line between you know the success and wealth building. It's really education. So Jennifer, as you mentioned, you know you, you had a really you know, sad experience going to career day. Um, just want to talk about my experience going to career day. Uh, so again, I'm very fortunate that um, I work for ASE. Uh, my background, it's in finance, it, it's in accounting, and that's really how I got my start into here. Um, so we did some community development along Gurney Street. So we got a grant in order to redevelop a portion of that. Um, so we both uh, you did, you know, focus groups, right, with seniors and then with the students at visitation. So um, the students and the seniors created this poem. So we had a poet who was Latino who came out and worked with them. The painter, the artist who did all the work, Malta Sanchez, who's incredible. Um, if you want to check out her artwork, stop by Second in Indiana. She has a great piece uh, at Asi's New Development. Um, so we went to do a reading day because once they created all these poems, um, we went back to the kids, the ones that actually, you know, drew and, and helped come up with the concept. We went, it just so happened that it was, you know, during career day. So it was like perfect. So, you know, within our industry, right, of community development, as I mentioned, there's very many paths, right? And that leads you to, to this work. Um, so part of my team, again, was a Latino who was a poet. And so they got to experience what he does and he got up and, and he talked to the kids regarding what he does. We had Malta Sanchez, who was an artist and, you know, she, she talked about, you know, how she became, you know, a, a you know, famous uh, painter and, and, you know, her, you know, uh, career path. And then, you know, of course I spoke as, you know, somebody in community development who started my um, career in finance and in accounting. And then our community engagement group. So I had an LPN who, started out, you know, wanting to make a change and ended up running our livability academy. Her name was Ellie Matthew and she talked about what her profession was and how she ended up in community development. And then Stasia Montero, who's our NAC uh, coordinator, uh, her background is education. Um, and so we have sort of a, a pool of all these Latinos with different backgrounds. 
projects that um, make up what we call this industry of community development and design. Um, so, you know, it was a really neat experience to have the kids learn about a bunch of different careers, um, but yet we all came together to really redevelop our community uh, and work in, in community development. So, but education again is the key. That, that's that's you know that's another dotted line. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit um, and you know just ask everybody in the panelists. This this talk is about equity, um, and so um, you know if if you guys can share your experience as a Latino professional, and uh, share if your race has limited you in your advancement. Uh, career-wise. I want to start with Eric, and then we'll let the rest of the panel go. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, I think for me, personally, like I said earlier, it's more of a, a feeling that, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm an imposter because maybe I was given some of the success because um, of uh, my race or um, I just got lucky and they needed someone that looked like me and their team, but, um, directly, I mean, I don't think I've, uh, uh, been lucky enough to not really, besides that, feel like it's limited me. I've been blessed with the, with a really successful career at Santander, um, in finance for the past 10 years. Um, so I try to just give back to the community as much as I can and educate everybody, um, around it, um. Definitely, you know, I think um, I'm one of the few, uh, perhaps, um, you know, especially as, like I said, like, I'm a male, I'm a little bit luckier. I think females have a harder time in finance. I see it, uh, um, you know, I've seen it in the past where they have to um, <clears throat> work a lot more, uh, showcase a lot more of their abilities. And um, that's a big disadvantage I've seen in my world. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, for me personally, I'm, I've been blessed like that. I think for the most part, it's just my self confidence that sometimes affects me, um, in, in work, in my workplace, but, uh, to overcome that, you just have to be, um, driven and passionate about what you do, uh. So, you know, passionate about helping the businesses, confident about helping uh, or showing that you are capable of adding value to the businesses that uh, are giving you the opportunity. Um, you know, maybe indirectly that there's been some noise in the background, but I, uh, directly, you know, it's uh, something I've been fortunate with in my career. And, um, you know, I've seen it in my family uh, more so than myself, you know, my, I'm a first generation immigrant. Um, my mom and dad, my mom has been cleaning houses for 25 years. My dad's been painting houses for the same amount of time. Um, so you see that discrimination against them because, you know, they're lower class citizen, under quotes, you know, they've been working their asses off for 30 years, but somehow they're lesser than everybody else. Um, so, you know, that's where my passion comes from. Um, Unfortunately, I don't have an accent, um, so that doesn't come into play as often. But you know, some people don't even know if I'm really Latino <laughs> until you know I start talking to them about it. So um, yeah, it's a uh, it's a different world than than uh, some of my peers and my my own family. Perfect. Thank thank you, Eric. Uh, Damaris. Um, I've been fortunate because I've been working in um, a Latino organization most of my career, the greater portion of my career. Um, and so I haven't felt any discrimination of, uh, against my, my race. If anything, it has been a benefit that I am bilingual, that I am Latina. Um, moving, over, moving to the city now um, is a little bit different because you can count the Latinos in the city, especially administration-wise. Um, it's the first time we have so many Latina administration leading in top uh, positions in the city. As I stated before, we have the city solicitor who is um, Latina, 
we have the deputy managing director who is current deputy managing director of community service who is Latina. And we also have Cynthia Figueroa who is the deputy mayor in um, within the mayor's office who's Latina. And this is just three among so many. I can't forget Amy Osobio who also is leading office of immigrants affairs um, currently who is Latina. And this is just a handful of Latinas that I am mentioning now, there's others. Um, but I do feel actually very proud that I get to represent my Latino community, especially women, in a, one of the high ranking um, positions within the managing director's office. So for me it has been, um, I haven't seen the other side, which is that has um, played the role of not succeeding in my, in my role. It has played the role that I am successful in my role because being Latina, being able to connect with my, my Latino community, being able to um, go in and represent them as a, a, a fellow Latina and um, have been, having the ability of being bilingual and being able to communicate their needs and take, again, meeting them where they at and closing the gap between city resources and the Latino community. So I say that I, me, for me personally, in my experience, I have been blessed and I, I am so grateful and glad to represent my Latino community. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Amanda? I concur with Damaris. I've worked, the only non-profit uh, non organization I worked with <clears throat> is with ASE, Latino uh, organization. Um, I do want to echo what Eric said as well. I think it's more in your, in my mind, <laughs> more than anyone else. Um, just the confidence, uh, you know, moving into development now, and you know, being with Harry Maria, my my superiors, and listening to things I have to do. It's like, can I really do this? You know, I'm not, I'm not so confident in it. But you, you kind of like have to give yourself a confidence boost. Um, so I, I relate to that. I also relate to, you know, people, maybe if I worked at a different organization, it's possible. Um, also, you know, with my last name, you really can't tell that I am Puerto Rican. <laughs> so I think that also plays, uh, plays a part too. But, you know, I've, I've also been blessed that I haven't received any negativity just being a Latina. Perfect. Thank you. Jennifer? Well, I guess I'm the senior here in the panel um, <laughs> because um, so, you know, I think I, my experience is a little bit, I think, peculiar in that I am born and raised in Puerto Rico and I came to the, the U.S. to pursue my undergraduate work in Boston, right? And so in Puerto Rico, you are Puerto Rican. It's a pretty homogeneous culture. Um, and so this idea of being a minority didn't quite sink in until until I lived in Philadelphia, frankly, um, you know, and by then I was 30 years old. Um, so I, you know, much of my early days, I was oblivious to the whole idea of being a minority or not. It just didn't quite register perfectly with me. Um, and like, but looking back, I am a product of affirmative action, right? And so this is this idea that you got into school, you did not really earn it. It was because you are Puerto Rican, and, you know. And I didn't know what affirmative action. I did not know that I was part of this affirmative action movement until much later that I realized, oh, you know, I I benefited from that. But then this is what I would tell people like Eric is that there are plenty of people that are not of color, but plenty of white people that have obtained their jobs and their positions because of people they know, not because of they, they, have, they have not earned it either, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so there's plenty of people out there that are in positions that for whom, for which they're not qualified and they have taken them anyway. You know, there are plenty of people out there for whom a relationship to somebody that could make a decision was the reason why they obtained the, you know, the position, the job, or even the scholarship that they received, right? There's plenty of 
of financial aid in our in our universities that are purely given to somebody because of the relationships they have with the university, whether it's alumni relationship or funding relationship or such. So I mean, so I just do not apologize for for the positions or the work that I've done. Um, the fact is that the outcomes prove that I have been um, qualified or or at least have risen to the or have you know grown to perform to the job. Um, so, you know, I will say as well that, um, you know, I, at the time when I started working in community and economic development, I was oftentimes the only female or one of the few females, one of the younger people in the room, and certainly the only Latina in the room in many, many instances, right? Um, so in many ways, um, also because I had a master's degree and a bachelor's degree from reputable institutions in many ways that compensates for the lack of relationships or the lack of experience um, and being a little bit of a unicorn, you know, not many, if any city planners or people in the private public industry that were Latinas, uh, in many ways, I think I benefited from my background rather than have it be uh, detrimental to it. Now, it is when you're the only person and you look around, that is really troublesome to me. I think there should be many more city planners um, with this background. There should be many more uh, women and Latinas in public, private, you know, um, uh, positions, uh, financing positions. Um, but ultimately for me, Harry, um, it's been a blessing and, and not the other way around. Perfect. Um, so th thank you for that. Um, I do want to go back to something that, you know, Eric was mentioning, right? So, you know, financing, you know, uh, and, you know, sort of like the opportunities that we receive, right? So us as the younger generation have new opportunities that our parents really did not um, have, right? So access to capital financing. And then, you know, sort of sort of the re recent, you know, events with the social injustice, right? So the George Floyd and this new sort of, you know, uh, wave that's happening in our country where we are really looking at injustice, you know, and figuring out how we can close that gap. So just want to ask the panel, right, how do we take advantage of this moment in time where really a country as a whole is really looking at the inequality that uh, is currently happening? And, and how can us as the Latino community capitalize in this moment in time and really make up ground uh, to wealth building and having some of the young professionals be part of our industry? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I, to keep it short, to well, the short answer, I guess, just be loud with your voice right now. I mean, you have to be heard. Um, I think a lot of the Latino community um, right now um, is kind of uh, just left behind a little bit. Um, maybe a little gets lost in between all the noise uh, and the diversity talk. Um, one of the reasons I think is because we're, we're so diverse within our own community, right? We're not, um, we're not all the same. Um, so it's hard to bring us all together. It's hard to really, um, not hard, but it's, it's different. It's more of a challenge than, than maybe the LGBTQ community or the black community, um, that they can stand behind, you know, the, the abuse and rights that they had in the movement in the sixties. And, um, but the Latino community, you know, we, we're very diverse. I mean, you talk to a Cuban, you talk to a Mexican, you talk to a Colombian, they all come from different backgrounds. Um, you know, we, we have a pretty big LGBTQ community in the Hispanic population um, that identifies as that. And, um, you know, I think the main uh, unity that we can stand behind is progress. I think every single Latino immigrant that comes to the US um, wants to build progress. They want their children to proceed or to um, 
to be successful. They want, they want personally to be successful. And, and that's what drives every single Latino and immigrant in, in the US. Um, so be loud about, you know, how you want to prosper, be loud how, about your voice and what uh, your feedback that to your manager. Um, if you don't, uh, if you see something that you uh, want to get uh, done, or if you see something that you don't like, uh, give some feedback to your peers and to your community leaders. Um, so I, I think that's the, the short answer, I guess, for that question. <laughs> Perfect. Anybody else from the panelists before we go to questions? Yeah, I got to agree with Eric. Um, we uh, Latinos have to be very united um, and not work in silos and use our voices. Uh, one thing, and as I said it when I for you first, you gave me the first question, when Concilio first was established in 1962, they were called La Voz de la Comunidad. And it was just a few individuals who got together and look what they evolved. 60, 60 years later, we have an organization with such a rich history because these individuals got together in a basement table and said, we have to address the um, inequity that's going on with our Latino community. Um, so much has evolved from that. So much has come from that. So uh, us as Latinos, and we do get lost in the noise, you correct, Eric, I feel like we do. Um, we need to um, really listen to our, um, our older uh, Puerto Ricans and Latinos who, who say we gotta do something and we gotta get together and we gotta raise our voices. We have to educate our youth so they won't forget their history. They won't forget how um, Philadelphia, um, how Latinos really have to fight to be where they at now. Because coming from 1950 to now, Latinos are in a way, they, I mean, we are a way better platform. Um, so we got to keep that going. So I think uh, one of the ways is to educate our youth um, give them the tools so they can continue advocating for the Latino community and be the voice and carry on. So um, that's my point. That's my take back with that. Right. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to sort of point out the great diversity that we have in this panel, right? So we're all Latino. We speak different dialect of Spanish, right? But we all understand each other. And, you know, just, just look at our skin color. We all come from me as one of the darker Latinos, all the way to, you know, Amanda, who's one of the lighter ones. So, um, you know, I, th I think it's great that you bring that up, uh, <laughs> Eric, uh, because it, it's something that, you know, I take pride within, you know, my, my Latino, uh, you know, heritage is that we come from all different shapes and sizes. And, uh, but pride is, is something that we all, you know, uh, really experience with, with our Latino, um, you know, uh, culture. Um, we're running out of time, so we're going to go into the questions uh, from the attendees. Uh, so the first one, and then any you know any one of the panelists can jump in. Uh, do we know of any educational programs for minorities in elementary, middle, and high school to introduce them to the concepts of financial literacy early on? So I know this is a topic that us is very interested to do. Unfortunately, it's very hard to get into the public schools. Um, but if you have a specific um, school that is interested, us is willing to do a curriculum for those students. Perfect. Perry, um, a lot of the banks do have curriculum for for different you know ages even schools so um connecting with your local uh local banks is probably a really good idea if that's something you're looking to bring and i think eric you can probably talk about that yeah no we definitely provide financial literacy like courses that organizations can use um and there's plenty of organizations. I think the Welcoming Center is one where they help adults um, with financial literacy, the Welcoming Center for New Pennsylvanians. Um, and they have bilinguals in there too. Um, and there, there, I don't know one in Philadelphia for middle school or high school, um, but it's a good takeaway. I know there's one, it's more like a um, trade, uh, center it's called but it's in berks county berks tech central 
um, which is part of the economic development in that county. Um, they also provide financial literacy, um, bilingual, help with GEDs. Um, so it's, it's, there's there's plenty of organizations that the banks support and provide their um, courses to uh, or curriculum to. Um, so I, that's a good takeaway in terms of actually putting it into the public system, though, because um, it's still to happen. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we're going to go to question number two. Uh, can we recommend any professional organizations for Latinos to collect to connect with other Latinos in the field? Um, so I'll, I'll start with one, of course, the design collaborative, community design collaborative. Um, if there's any Latinos that are in the field and would like to volunteer, please uh, go to our website uh, and reach out to us. So that's one. Uh, to the panel, any other organizations that you guys know? I think you have some, some folks in the in the audience um, mentioned NOMA, the National Organization of Minority Architects and uh, the uh, Hispanic Engineering Organization. Um, I did mention earlier that Hispanic Chamber does have a professional network. Um, and so I don't know that there is a Latino architect or you know, in the design industry in Philadelphia, particularly. So there's something to think about there. Perfect. So for, you know, if you're in development, certainly APM, they do development, right? So they develop low income um, senior housing. So that's an organization you can certainly reach out to. Of course, ASE, uh, we're in development. So if there's any professionals that, um, you know, would like to connect with us, please go onto our website, uh, you know, reach out to us and uh, we can see if we can, if we can work together. Um, so, and then Jennifer, you sort of dovetailed into question number three. Uh, so from one of our, um, you know, attendees, uh, his question is, as a Latino architect in Philadelphia, to his knowledge, there isn't uh, no local organization that specifics, uh, specifically deals with Latinos in design, architecture, and community development, you know, and also real estate. Um, ULI uh, has a subcommittee, and then the closest might be NOMA, um, National Organization of Minority Architects. Uh, but yeah, maybe we do need to start one. Uh, it's probably part of our education, um, you know, the, you know, and how we pass that on to the, the, the future uh, you know, future Latinos that are coming up. And, you know, like to me, it would be great to sort of, you know, sort of marry the two together, right? So let's talk about financial literacy uh, to our youth, right? And then also like, hey, we have this great industry, you know, in, in community development and design that, that you can you can be part of. So, um, you know, it, it, maybe there's an opportunity there that we can sort of uh, marry the other two. Um, is there any other questions uh, from the attendees? Hey, Harry, it's Taya. Um, can I expand on the answer you guys just gave? I know I'm like yes. disembodied head now. Sorry. Here, I'll turn on my video so I'm not creepy. Um, to answer the question, because I did try to answer it in the Q&A about Latino organizations in sort of the design side of the field, there are some organizations and I did want to shout them out, NOMA. And of course, I always rep NOMA. I was most recently the local chapter president for five years. I'm currently on the national board on my way to the conference this week, so I will always up NOMA, um, but there is also an organization, Architectos. Um, Architectos started here in Chicago, um, and uh, which is where I am currently, and um, and um, they have expanded. So mostly to the to the southwest and to the west, obviously where there's really large uh, Latinx design populations of professionals. Um, but the organization is the only national organization for architects. There are two organizations nationally for engineers, um, and those are kind of the only two that, that kind of segment out that specific population other than the subcommittee at ULI that you're talking about. Um, the group of architectos is always looking for people to start chapters, both student chapters at universities and professional chapters. And so they're always looking for organizations that are looking to 
um, sort of expand. But you know, since Jennifer's here, I gotta I gotta say, like most of them are starting in conjunction or in connection with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce in their cities. And so I'd say, you know, I would encourage professionals in Philadelphia that are interested to definitely think about it and like not our typical resource, but definitely I know all of the presidents of these organizations nationally. So if anyone in Philly would like more information, I would be happy to kind of link you guys. Perfect, thank you. Uh, You're welcome. Um, I wanna thank our panelists. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, participating and really giving, you know, uh, your version, your experience of being a Latino and Latina uh, within, you know, the Philadelphia area and, and, you know, community development and design. So thank you very much. Um, so with that, we have about two minutes. So any last, uh, words of wisdoms from the panel? No, what I would say is like, I think all of you are going with homework. <laughs> Get more engaged, you know, recruit more Latinos or become more involved with you so that, um, so that we can, you know, this conversation can actually move and, and get better outcomes moving forward. No, thanks, Harry. Um, yeah, I, I mean, if, I've been in Philly for 10 years, like I said, I've seen tremendous progress coming from the DMV area, DC, Maryland, Virginia area. There's tons of Latinos, mostly Central Americans in there. Um, but Philadelphia has, you know, won my heart. I think it has great potential. Um, I love living in the city and, uh, you know, I think, I think we made progress, like I said, so happy to be here. Thank you for having me on. Um, I just say, keep being the voice for the Latino community. We just keep spreading the words and being that voice and that advocate. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right, we're out of time. Thank you again um, for being with us. Uh, see you soon. <laughs>